there are elements about uh, the fall of Rome that, that are really quite curious. Um, and we find after Nicaea that it is not long before we start to see physical indications that that Rome or at least the western part of Rome will fall it was all, it all is only 408 that Alaric the the vandal sacks Rome well there are a lot of events and elements that lead up to this point and I think that those should not be overlooked <clears throat> as early as the first century BC BCE as early as the first century BCE there were migrations from the north going on those migrations <clears throat> were from lingering Celtic groups they're from uh, they're from uh, Gauls from France they're from there's from Teutons uh, German they're uh, e even a little bit from uh, the east and those they were just migrations there would be there would be a a society that would move into a valley and and start to till and they were docile they were they were not uh, a threat and Rome didn't see that as a threat Now, interestingly enough, is essentially what you have is in these migrations, you have several things just enough out of whack to indicate that there could be a problem. But the way that the migrations happened it was very innocuous after all Rome was powerful the Roman Empire could could absorb them and make use of them but they had not they did not have a, a status as from those say in the in the east who were conquered and became slaves and then then showed their their prowess as a society to the empire they just moved in and utilized the land now one of the things that that it, it is kind of like a facade or a a, a smoke screen in a way that Rome was not aware that they maintained their past cultures where those of the East to survive and to to seek toward freedom would be completely um, driven toward either a Hellenistic ideal or a Latin ideal and their societies would become either Hellenistic or Latin probably the hardest group that would be uh, should I say not willing to to succumb to Hellenistic or Latin ways would be the Jews and yet we see that they did and it was in a sense out of necessity that they do that otherwise they would not survive as a population but not so from the north 
And so those migrations continued and continued. And in the north region, if you take a look at the map uh, that's provided there, uh, the bar barbarian in invasions, you see all these group of barbarians coming in in the 5th century, but where are they coming into? Where the settlements were from the migrations. So here comes the military behind this wave of migration. Well, essentially, what they had was a society still intact and, and almost, in a sense, welcoming their brethren, barbarians from the north. In other words, the migration made it so that those who were citizens of Rome by land ownings and by utilization of land did not defend the empire from, from the onslaught of the military invasions. So, in other words, Rome was very weakened by sheer numbers. By sheer numbers. And, and yet they had no idea about those sheer numbers. The regions and the principalities of Rome would then, each one, dissolve on its own. You see a stage being set here. And that stage is very feudalistic. It's, it's, it is setting the appearance of medieval feudalism. That those regions outside of military support in Rome would be, would be governed by a strong military figure in the area that was of barbaric origin. Now, I don't like to refer to them as barbarians. And, I, and I'll tell you why. Because their societies were as, as developed as that of Rome. It's just that they were developed in a different sort, in a different in a different fashion, in a different way. And they had some of the skills and the technology that Rome needed desperately. So these migrations contributed a great deal and, and they are very early. That sets the stage for this onslaught uh, of, of might from the north. And, and what Rome finds by the 4th century is that it is in constant turmoil on the outskirts, on the border uh, principalities or on the, on the border regions of Rome. So, so this... This, uh, this second uh, area was, was the onslaught from north. North and east and, and, and west. They had nothing to compare this before. There was no comparison from previous history. This was a new group of migrations. Little did they know that these migrations would be followed by an onslaught. I, an example, and I, I want to I give you an example of medieval uh, invasions. And the Vikings were doing the same thing in the 9th, 10th, and 11th centuries. And, and many Vikings came down to the land in Europe, into the continent, and settled. Nothing happened. 
they were just incorporated into the heap, so to speak. Same within, in, uh, within the English or the Isles, the British Isles. Same thing. The Vikings came down in a migratory mode as settlers. But right behind them is the military, is the, is the barbaric hordes. And again, I don't like to use that, but especially because I belong to that group. <laughs> no, that's, you know, I'm, I'm probably as much of a berserk as they are. <laughs> anyway, um, so, so you, you, you had these invasions following these migrations, and it took those who were in the land prior by surprise. It took the Celts by surprise. It took the, it took the Romans by surprise. Uh, the illustration uh, is uh, in Scotland, in the Dalriadi uh, uh, Kingdom of Scotland, when the, when the big heavy um, onslaught of the Vikings were taking place, the, the, the posts in the Hebrides observed a fleet of Viking warships of around 10,000. Now, when you, when, you, when you start to do the math and you put 50 berserks in one longboat coming down, that's a great force. Well, they split... And about 1,500 of those longboats landed in, in Great Britain or in the British Isles. The rest of them go to Normandy, in which we get the understanding of Norman, which is the Norseman. Oh gosh, they're Vikings. They aren't French. They're Vikings. They're not Latin. So that entire Norman invasion that happens in 1066 in, the, in Great Britain is the Norwegians. They're going back into England again by William the Conqueror. He's a Viking. He's not French. He's a Viking. Anyway, I can see some smiles. There you, you oofed off, huh? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that gives you kind of an illustration of, of, of what took place in Rome. Rome was much more powerful than the Celtic, uh, than the Celtic kingdoms in, uh, in England, than the, than the Saxon and, and the Angle uh, kingdoms in, in England. And, and so you have this incredible onslaught. We aren't talking about a few hundred men or soldiers. When Alaric crosses the Seine, the Seine or the Rhine, anywhere when uh, Alaric crosses, <laughs> that's terrible, in 408 and, and sacks Rome, he doesn't sack Rome with a small force. He sacks Rome with tens of thousands with him. So you, you have this incredible force and it wasn't just Alaric at the same time if you look at this map you'll see it's the Ostrogoths it's the Vandals it's the Burgundians it's the it's the it's the Lombards it's the um, later the Huns it's uh, the the Alans and on and on and on Rome did not stand a chance to survive But mind you this, there was no love lost from those groups. And there was no love loss from these groups here. They did not mourn the death of Rome. They did not mourn the onslaught happening in Rome. <clears throat> uh, 
um, immediately what you find, what you see, is, is Rome starts to withdraw military support. But there was, a, there was another element to that, too. That what Rome found was that military support was, by and large, these migration groups. That those who were guarding their borders were from these groups who were carrying on the onslaught. And so, region after region after region falls. And it happens quite quickly. You can see the strength of to be able to be strong enough to put both empires together, east and west together again. You can see that strength there militarily to accomplish it. And, and you also see this, that at the time of Constantine, the empire was never bigger. Ah, but it's not all land. It's not the person who, who, who has more land that is the stronger. It's just by sheer number, it's the person with, with strength in numbers at this time. Now, it's a lot different today, and, and history will, will, in a sense, not repeat itself today because there's a lot more involved. There's, there's technologies involved. Um, even though Rome had, an, for the time, had an incredibly technical uh, system of warfare, when your enemy can lose 20,000 men on the, on the battlefield and still, and still drive ahead, there's nothing to be done. And the Roman military might and the technical might was based on the outskirts because Rome was always moving forward. So it was based on large operations on the outskirts, they wouldn't use that in Rome. You would not set up an onager and, and uh, shoot off an onager in your own city. You'd destroy your own city. But you see the Allens and the Huns and, uh, and the Vandals didn't care about destroying the city because they didn't build the city. <clears throat> so, this caused a drawback of military in, in, the, in support of, of the outskirts. Rome's option was to start to negotiate with these groups to buy them off. So Rome starts to buy the uh, barbarians off. Well, it takes a lot of money. And the tax burden became incredible to the Roman citizens. The tax burden to, to keep them in peace was, was uh, overbearing. This also set up, this whole process set up feudalism. The entire tax system of Rome set up feudalism. If you had a, a lord or an aristocrat that was strong and there were smaller 
landowners and he and the taxes were coming to this master lord who would then send that off to Rome who would send the taxes off to Rome well if this master lord got strong enough he could challenge Rome and that was happening all the time and so it didn't matter who this lord was it could be one of these groups from the migration or it could be a Roman himself but gee whiz I've got this good thing going and I'm getting wealthy and I'm, I'm protecting these little estates from the onslaught that is happening here and so it set things up for feudalism Yes. I'm sorry, can I ask? Yes. Uh, just to get a frame of reference, when did the drawback start and the, the payoffs by Rome ah, start? Ah, good question. When did the drawbacks start and the payoffs start? This was about uh, 4th century. At the time of... Uh, toward the end of the 4th century. Uh, about 350 three to, to 400. Um, at, at the time of um, St. Patrick's uh, enslavement in Ireland, which was about 375, right around there, 380, the Lord, the noble Lord and the military had already departed from, from uh, the British Isles. Uh, but there were, there were some lords that remained, uh, some landowners that remained and, and put together mercenary forces uh, from the Celtic groups. And so, so it, it, that gives you an idea of how, of, of how quickly it's, it's, it's dissolving. It's dissolving within, within a generation. By the time... By the time St. Patrick becomes the bishop in, in, uh, in England, of England. It wasn't England then, by the way. <laughs> but by the time he becomes the bishop, Alaric has sacked Rome. So, that is 30, 40 years or 30 years, even within 30 years, um, that process is taking place. So it, it dissolved quickly. There were other things going on within the Rome. There were rebellions. Now, the, the system of Rome itself, so there was an eter internal strife. within Rome itself, within the legions themselves. Remember this, that whoever controlled the military in Rome was Caesar. And many a Caesar fell to their own military because the military abandoned them. Now, to give you an example, Gratian, uh, 395 A.D., Read a, I want to read a, a passage out of, uh, out of Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire uh, by Edward Gibbon. It's the classic uh, three-volume uh, set. The conscience of the credulous princess, prince, excuse me, and he's talking about Gratian here, was directed by saints and bishops. who procured an imperial edict to punish as a capital offense the violation and neglect or even the ignorance of the divine law. Uh, one of the things that Gratian did uh, is he, 
he uh, put together a, quite a entourage of counselors and, and he drew heavily from the leadership of the church especially out of Rome even though he himself was off and on in the Eastern Empire now finally Theodosius II I believe it was uh, becomes the emperor of the East Gratian is the emperor of the West his dependence upon his, his uh, clergy uh, as counselors starts to alienate the military. There's another thing that happens. Uh, he became involved in hunting, actually, in the hunting for sport. And so he put together, just outside of Rome, uh, refuges for his hunting for imperi- imperial hunting and, and he would bring great uh, men of the kingdom in or the empire in and, and uh, entertain them in, in the sport well what he did was he, uh, he went to the groups outside that were that were had prowess in hunting and guess what group had the most prowess in hunting was the Scythians or the Alani the Alans and so he got enamored with the Scythian military Scythian um, culture the Scythian hunting prowess and and he he also brought them in as counselors all this time not paying much attention to his military as a result the military loses confidence in Gratian but not before he put on the garb of a Scythian now remember this that these were the ones who the military had been fighting for so long and so essentially what they saw Gratian doing and Gratian wasn't a bad emperor mind you what they saw Gratian doing was was selling Rome to the Scythians and they lost all, complete confidence in Gratian and, and they organized a rebellion and they assassinate Gratian emperor after emperor after emperor falls this way so this internal strife that occurs this, this, uh, this contest if you will uh, between the emperor between the emperor And, uh, and, the, and the military uh, intensifies and the military essentially are still in a position to put whomever they want on the throne now you have uh, all of this playing together don't you Um, and as a result it completely weakens the empire but I want to emphasize this it does not destroy the empire because the empire will live in law and you see this time again time and again that the people even of the outskirts even closest to these onslaughts you see them relying on Roman law 
as security, even though there's n nothing militarily that can protect them. They re rely on Roman law, and, and they herald that. That goes hand in hand with their way of life. And so as these onslaughts happen, those who are coming in actually try to keep it intact. Even though the land is being, should I say, divided, Roman law is intact. Now that, that there's a turnaround there then. There's a turnaround there. And that turnaround is when the Bishop of Rome becomes the emperor. Now, I want to backtrack a little bit because these migrations become very important for the church. And what these, those who are being, who are coming in under these migrations after about 250, after about 250, are being evangelized in a big fashion. So essentially they become Christian. And so it is a, by the time of, by the time of Constantine, he's not doing anything that already isn't done within Christianity. Most people in the realm are Christian. He's not doing anything that, ha that isn't already established. And evangelism had probably had its heyday during per persecution. <clears throat> to the Roman, it could have been something that was very chic <laughs> to be Christian. But it is, by the time of Constantine, Christianity becomes the empire. And by the time Constantine dies, Christianity is the empire. And so, there's... There's a dualistic thing happening out in the outback, out in the, in the borders. And that, that dualistic thing is, here comes my, here come my, my relatives. They are not Christian, but they will listen. By the way, it's even said that Attila the Hun may have been converted to Christianity. And I know this, that Leo, uh, Leo the Great, uh, made a pact with Attila the Hun and certainly bought him off, but also sick him on the Eastern Empire in, instead of the Western Empire. So Attila uh, started to, uh, to, uh, to look elsewhere after this pact. This, uh, in the West, this created some, should I say, um, not clear lines between the, between the social order, between Christianity and the church, and the polit political powers. 
And when Constantine left, well, l- l- let me let me set up let me set something up here first. Uh, I want to uh, now talk about the power transfer from from the empire and the emperor to the Church of Rome. And there were several things that, that I think are, are very substantial there. One certainly goes clear back to the second century and Tertullian and his statement of the preeminence of the Roman bishop. Now, not that that's what he meant, and I, and I also want to emphasize that, but this is going to be greatly used. I believe that Rome in itself would have declared Tertullian a heretic had it not been for that statement. That the Bishop of Rome and the churches of the West would have not gone with his understanding of the roles of the Son of God and the Father or of the Son and the Father. Because it was a little too... too Sabellian for him, for them. But what they did was they it, what they did was they twisted it in such a way that they could utilize it. And it was with it was by the use of Latin grammar that they could do this. And this was another one of those another one of those things that after the death of the language Latin, after its no non-use and it's going into a dormant dead stage that those terms were starting to become redefined that they know that persona no longer meant the persona that Tertullian was talking about that they that they actually meant individual person or being that that they were able to to should I say divide monotheism into something else so so they did that by changing the grammar essentially they did that by changing the language that was dying or dead in fact in my dissertation I discover that that uh, over 90% of the changes historical changes in Latin occur after death. And, and that caused me to raise my eyebrows and saying, well, why was it changing when it had died? It was no longer in use as a vernacular. Why would it change? Well, the very essence of Rome changed it because of the politic. So, Tertullian's statement lends itself to Rome becoming preeminent. The second uh, impact comes at the time of when Constantine enters into the throne of Rome. And the Milan policy of 312, when, when all lands owned by the Christians are returned. And then the 315 edict when preference is given and ta- and and uh, and tax incentive uh, is is given that the bishops of the church become tax exempt. That that the church now is in a position to become a very strong economic influence in, within the empire. That not only did they own great amounts of land, but they also were tax exempt. And remember, the, the, the strongest burden at this time on the citizens of Rome was in taxation. Most of the citizens of Rome 
as long as they own land, could be self, pretty self-sufficient. But the tax burden was so great. And that did not help at all that the clergy had tax-exempt status. So they were freed from all of the worries of this great burden. The third element uh, is that the Western Church in Rome early in, the, in Constantine's reign start to deny others freedom of conscience. That there was a search for those who would who would disrupt orthodoxy. And, and um, I want to read again that passage out of Decline and Fall because you get an element of, of what is going on. It says, The conscience of the, of the prince, uh, Gratian, was directed by saints and bishops who procured an imperial edict to punish as a capital offense Ah, the violation, the neglect, or even the ignorance of divine law. It became a capital offense to carry on the old religion of Rome. It was by edict that this took place. Intolerance came about by imperial edict. And it set the Western Church up for that very thing. They had edict now by Caesar that, remember, you could not undo edict. It, it was as long as Roman law existed, so did the edict. So it was very important for Rome to preserve what? Roman law. Because as long as they could preserve Roman law, then their edict would stand. I want to do a little sidetrack here. I want to uh, bring something uh, up uh, that Gibbon writes. He says, If Constantine had the advantage of erecting the standard of the cross, the emulation of his, successor, his successor assumed the merit of subduing the Arian heresy and of abolishing the worship of idols in the Roman world. <clears throat> what the church started to do then is the church started to utilize the edicts that Constantine had started by raising the standard of the cross. Now remember when Constantine took um, took the Western Empire when he had and, and also when he had defeated uh, Maximus uh, in the Dardanelles, he took on the cross as his standard. Well, what that did was that opened up the church to also take on the cross as its standard. And as a result, that edict of him raising military under the cross that enabled the church to raise military. <clears throat> In other words, the edict that would go forth from Rome to, should I say war, and go to war 
would be under the cross, under the standard of the cross. In fact, during the Crusades, that's what they did. They, they, they raised the Crusades by the fiery cross. And they'd send out a fiery cross throughout the land and, and all of these nobility would rally to it for Rome. So that was the beginning of that process. That Rome as a church now could raise a military power. That happened early. That happened by 408. Most of the military that was guarding the city of Rome at the time of Alaric's sacking of Rome were Christian military under the cross, raised by the Bishop of Rome. The Council of Nicaea also had a big impact on... uh, on the transfer of power from the empire or the emperor to the church in Rome. The bestowment of the title of Patris to the Roman bishop becomes a, a, a very important element of that. In other words, he's raised in stature. Now, of course, in Nicaea, there were three raised in that stature. The, the Bishop of Antioch, the bis, Bishop of Alexandria, and the Bishop of Rome. And what took place afterwards is that Rome started to, the Roman bishops started to uh, look toward those two as allies. Now, if you could get one on your council, of those patrices, you would control the other one, wouldn't you? Antioch was not going to have anything to do with that. Antioch was not uh, necessarily the ally of Rome. And I want to emphasize that. But Alexandria becomes a very pertinent player through a young monk named Jerome. 380. And Jerome was from the school of Alexandria. And he was one of the ascetic monks in Egypt, in Alexandria, Egypt. And he (laughs) brought into the church all of his asceticism. But the political favor that was shown toward this young monk who was gaining great power in Alexandria was was incredible. But they raised up Jerome for that very purpose, to link the two together, to link the two seas that were called Patris. Before you know it, Jerome becomes Bishop of Rome. Ah, but he may be also Bishop of Alexandria. Or at least very close. He has quite a following in Alexandria, and he has, of course, the bishopric of, of Rome. Now I won't I won't uh, I won't go into detail yet about Jerome. Um, we'll save that for a little later. But this is part of the influence that is going on to bring the power. Of, of Rome to the Church of Rome, bring the power of the empire in its possession. Now, earlier than this, a sixth item. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. Fifth item. Constantine deeding the palace of Rome to the bishop in 326. And it was interpreted that the empirical scepter 
of the Western Empire or Rome itself was handed over at that time. And that notion, by the way, went on for close to 500 years before it was dispelled. But the damage had already been done in 500 years. They didn't even have to use that as a, a reference anymore <laughs> because they already had the power of Rome. And that is the popes or the, or the bishops. A sixth... Um, a sixth uh, element is uh, that Rome abandons Greek about the same time, completely abandoned Greek uh, for Old Italic and later Latin texts. And those Latin texts, there were some earlier Latin texts than the Vulgate, but this was all done specifically uh, by Jerome. Um, I, I believe mostly because, because of the Western attitude toward the Eastern churches. That, that Antioch and Constantinople controlled the Eastern churches, whereas Alexandria and Rome controlled the, the Western churches. And to control the Western churches thoroughly uh, Latinization of the scriptures would be pertinent or imperative. <clears throat> Rome and the Western church also dissolved their relationship little by little with the East so that in Nicaea, for instance, there was, there was quite an entourage of Western churches, not the Bishop of Rome. But by the next council, by the, by, uh, the Constantinople Council in 381, there is no uh, Western representative from any of the bishoprics in the West. It is 150 bishops from the East. So, essentially, the West withdrew. They were invited to... They were invited to Constantinople and to the council by both Gratian and Theodosius. Both Gratian and Theodosius sought to bring the church back together in unity and it did not work. That uh, the Roman bishop would control the West and, and he would pressure all the Western bishops not to attend. Finally, finally the final in between 440 and 461 when Pope Leo declares himself Pontificus Maximus and that, that he controls the power of Rome. There were a couple of elements that Leo utilized to do this. He had already received he had already received the power of decretals by all the churches in the West that that they would always defer that every bishop of the West would defer judgment to the Roman bishop. That's called decretals. And that becomes a very important tool uh, in, in later in the Middle Age where, where out of those decretals and later edict because, because Leo declared himself Pontificus Maximus he has not only 
the law of the church at his, in his scepter, but he also has the law of Rome. So he is, he's, he's not just the emperor of Rome, he is also the head of the church. Or he is becoming something greater. Another, another tool that Leo used, he was the one that had the interpretation of the keys. And that he, in his hand, held those keys because of Peter and that he could bind and he could loose. In other words, he had the keys to hell. And he would utilize that and the salvation that he held as a tool for his political uh, prowess. Now, <clears throat> in the meantime, in in the East, the churches of the East are are formulating their theological direction uh, by councils, and um, there are around seven or eight uh, ecclesiastical councils. Um, even though uh, the Council of Arles was the first council of the church after, uh, after the, um, Constantine becomes emperor, but the, the first ecclesiastical council was the Council of Nicaea, and, and we discussed that a little bit uh, before. <clears throat> Um, the second council is uh, the Council of Constantinople. And, uh, and that council is uh, convened by Gratian and, uh, and, uh, and Theodosius uh, from the east, Gratian from the west. And its purpose was to bring the bishops together to try to hammer out some sort of unity. And the West doesn't show up. Uh, the Council is 381. Okay. Yes. Approximately 150 representatives from the Eastern Church were in attendance and, and not one representative uh, appeared from the West. The issues uh, were um, the issues were uh, uh, what was called the Nestorianism Excuse me, no, this wasn't Nestorianism. It was, um, it was Apollonianism, which was a... Um, Apollonius was the bishop of Bithynia. <clears throat> and I think we'll stop there and we'll, we'll convene after.